Hello everyone, welcome to my show Career Leadership Podcast, a podcast to spotlight purpose-driven Asian leaders making an impact. This is your host Priyanka Kumla joining you on our 107th episode of Career Leadership Podcast. Thank you for your loyal support and as a reminder, do subscribe by following me Priyanka Kumla and a Career Leadership Podcast page on LinkedIn to receive your LinkedIn live notifications. We're also on YouTube, so if you're watching this on YouTube, give us a subscribe and a like and we broadcast every week, every Sunday with wonderful nuggets of wisdom from the Asian diaspora at 1 p.m. Eastern and 10.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time. And you can hear us on any podcast streaming platform. So give us a follow, a review and a rating, so we know how this podcast is helping you become a better version of yourself. With that, I'm going to switch on to my fabulous guest who's joining us from the Bay Area, Aarti Garg. Hey, Aarti, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure for me, Aarti, and I'm super excited to bring you onto the show. And to our listeners, let me give you an introduction about who Aarti is. She's someone who believes that the solution to society's most difficult and important challenges lie at the intersection of government, industry, and academic sectors. And she's finding a way to build alignment across all of them. She also leads advanced AI technology efforts at HP, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and I'm going to ask her more fun things about self-driving vehicles because we both love the feeling of not driving. So, you know, <laughs> many more fun things on those lines, Aarti. And Aarti has a keen interest in new technologies as well as she has a broad background across the three sectors that I mentioned, be it government, industry, and academic. She has a lot of accomplishments under her belt, which I'm going to unveil as we go <laughs> through the show. Aarti, are you excited about being part of our community of Career Leadership Podcast? Definitely. That's awesome. So Aarti, you know, I should say Dr. Aarti, given you have a PhD, you know, something that really fascinates about me is amidst all your accomplishments, your, your degrees, your doctorate in philosophy, as a child, uh, as a kid, during your childhood, one of your fond memories was ice creams and balloons at the India Gate, though you grew up in, you know, Michigan, Detroit. So tell us a little bit, taking us back to those old days of the India Gate. Yeah, so I, I consider myself a very fortunate member of the Indian diaspora in the sense that um, my parents always made it a priority to have us visit our family in India. And we went frequently enough that I have these very fond and distinct memories of things that my cousins did, the kids um, in Delhi, it's a very common experience to go to India Gate kind of at night and get balloons and ice cream and just see all the action. And um, so that's just a fond memory of going with my aunts and uncles and cousins to enjoy something and, and maybe, you know, be in an experience that resembled some of the Indian parts of what I experienced as a child that weren't so reflected in opportunities available to kids in Michigan. I hear you. And I went to the University of Michigan, so I share some fond winter memories of being in Ann Arbor. <laughs> so let's talk about your career. You know, you're someone who believes, as I mentioned earlier during the show, you've balanced a career in technology with local government and community engagement. When you look back at this journey, what is one thing that's really helped you become who you are? Um, I think that maybe the one thing that is helpful on a journey like this is not to put yourself in any one box. So I do have a PhD in physics, as you mentioned, which in a way sort of tells you a lot about maybe where my academic and intellectual interests are. Maybe something people don't always know is I also have an undergraduate degree in literature where I studied Shakespeare. And in order to bring together some of the things that are important to me, bringing together government, interest in government, government engagement, with technology and science and with um, research, it really requires having that broad perspective of all, the, all these different things together. And I think that's the one thing I try not to do is say, I'm just a scientist or I'm just a technologist or I'm just a policy analyst. I try to say I'm all of those things. You know, I like the way how you look at yourself because not putting ourselves in a box is a huge challenge you know being part of the the asian community you know that's one stereotype that we're always put into you are a stem professional but mm -hmm. at the same time i know you have degrees from harvard and stanford 
and you are still looking at what's next. You know, how does the future going to look like? And having a progressive thought process is a huge challenge for a lot of us. Yeah, I think though one of the things is that in order to be effectively forward looking, I think the biggest lessons or the biggest information or the most information you can get about how to do something for the future is to start with what's happening today. Are there gaps? What's working? Sometimes, um, especially maybe where I live in Silicon Valley, there's often this desire to do something new and disruptive. And I tend to look a little bit differently saying, well, if stuff has evolved to be the way it is over decades or maybe even centuries, maybe there's something good about it too. And how do we take what's working and pair it with new ideas to address the parts that are not working? And I think that I will say one thing um, I've learned at the same time from Silicon Valley is how to in, how to use agile thinking processes, how to have an idea and come up with a hypothesis of a solution and test it out quickly. But I think the part that I like to add to it is remembering that what's already there, there's potentially something to be preserved. And let's make sure we think about that as well. You know, you have a very interesting philosophy about agile thinking. But before I get there, I'm yeah. going to acknowledge some of our live listeners and feel free to wave back at our live listeners as I flash them on the screen. We have Satya K, who's joining us from India, who says, hi, Priyanka. Hi, Satya. Welcome to the show. Uh, hi, Satya. And we have another LinkedIn user who's sharing a lot <laughs> of love on this Sunday. Um, we don't have the name yet. Thank you so much for joining us as well. So going back to the agile philosophy, Arti, you know, you work with academia, you work with government, and agile philosophy is always a challenge when you're looking at alignment across these two sectors. I mean, in private sectors and corporate, agile is embraced. But how do you handle the challenges of ensuring you, the stakeholders from these different sectors are on board with your ideas? Yeah, no, that's a great question and something I'm actually living very closely right now um, through some of my community engagement work. I'm currently part of a community innovation workshop that the city government, I um, am in the city where I live and that where I also serve as a an appointed commissioner. We're looking at reimagining public safety and we're doing it in a very agile way of having some of these intensive workshops to first interview community members and then come up with some ideas about you know what's the common thread to what our community members are saying and then try to develop solutions that our city leadership has even gotten on board with let's try to try them out quickly and one thing that's been very interesting about it is that what we've learned in our city is concerns with community safety are not necessarily the ones you hear on TV. They're very different. They're about wanting a feeling of inclusiveness in the government. And so it takes a lot of work, I think, to be open to new ideas and convince other people that it's worth being open to new ideas. But when you get that opportunity, I think just take it and embrace it and don't take no for an answer. Um, one of the things with this innovation workshop is there was a pushback against using stimulus money to try out some of these new ideas. And I actually spoke at a city council meeting um, as a public, as a member of the public earlier this week to say, I understand the concerns of not using existing funds because it might feel like this is a one-time thing, but let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Let's try to, let's try a new idea out and if it works, we'll solve the next problem, which may mean finding long-term funding for it. So I, I always like to break problems down into smaller challenges and solve them one at a time. I love this nugget of wisdom. So I would encourage all our listeners to note it down in terms of breaking complex problems into simpler ones so you can have more actionable steps to, towards a solution. And to our listeners, something that you also need to be aware of is that Dr. Arthi serves on the Community Services Commission in the city of Hayward, California. And those are the experiences that you were sharing. Now, Arthi, tell us this. In the past, you've spent several years working as a policy advisor and an analyst in the White House, as well as the US Congress. How has that experience shaped you to be a better negotiator when you're on the Community Services Commission? Yes, well, I will say that, especially 
having worked as a fellow in Congress, as an analyst in the White House, um, I would say it's not limited to my community services commission work. I think it's it cuts across everything that I do in my life, including my work as a technologist. And I think the main thing that I had to learn through those roles is to to look at all of the people who care about something, all of the stakeholders, and understand what their motivations are and understand maybe even more importantly what their values are. Because sometimes the solution that you're looking for is not any version of what anyone is proposing, but something else that reflects everybody's values and concerns. And so I found that can work whether you're talking about a new product launch or you're talking about a new policy. I think um, one thing though that I've learned in local government is that it's a lot more personal. You're talking about something that might impact your neighbor. And so in addition to this kind of, um, more abstract or distance analysis of what do different people want and value, there needs to be an element of that emotional connection as well, because it, it's going to affect somebody you know and care about very likely. And I agree that, you know, this experience cuts across, you know, any sector, any domain that you work around with, because yeah. this shapes you as a leader, you know, and it tells you more about the art of striking a card with your listeners. And I think that's very important when you're talking about these huge challenges that are more forward yeah. thinking. Yeah. All right. mm -hmm. So I have, um, I'm so excited about the fun part. <laughs> yes. Your role as the artificial intelligence head at HP. So tell us more about, you know, the, uh, the startup community that you work with, especially in the field of artificial intelligence. Yeah. So just to clarify for the listeners, um, in my role at HPE, I, I get, I think, a pretty fun job. And it includes maybe two major components. One is to work and develop partnerships with advanced AI technology companies, many of whom are in the Bay Area. But the nice thing about HPE is many of whom are around the world. And that includes startups, uh, software startups and processor startups. And it's I, you know, I've been pushing um, to work with earlier and earlier stage companies, younger and younger um, in terms of product maturity and just market maturity. And it's a, it's a lot of fun to look at new ideas, but then sort of bring the lens of how do I take this really interesting idea and make it useful and work with these enthusiastic technologists and founders to find that way, to find the way to bridge just becoming a partner in a company that's been around for decades and sort of led the initial technology revolutions that brought us to where we are today and now take this completely new emerging field of AI. And the other side of what I do is also to work internally a bit more to think about what are we doing next from a product and strategy point of view? How can we collaborate with government scientists and university scientists to really stay on the forefront of what's cutting edge in AI? You know, that's something that I'm really fascinated about. And before we delve deeper into our love for self-driving vehicles, <laughs> let's go and acknowledge some of our live listeners who have tuned in. We have Amita Gamage, who's watching this from Sri Lanka and who says, great interview. Thanks, Amita, for joining us. Thank you. And we have Harsh Purohit, who's joining us from Richmond, Virginia. Thanks, Harsh, for being one of our loyal listeners as well. Hi, Harsh. And to our live listeners, we have a free one-on-one -on -one session that's all up for grabs with Arti herself. So this is a chance to connect with a wonderful leader from the Asian community, as well as get to know a little bit more about the art of negotiation, right? You know, that's something that she has wonderfully mastered over the years. So all you have to do is drop in a quick question or a comment throughout the show, and we'll announce one lucky live listener by the end of the show. All right, so on your keyboard, uh, folks. And we already have Harsh saying he's learning something new. Awesome. That's wonderful to hear, Harsh. Thank you. So going back to our question about the love for self-driving vehicles. <laughs> you know, I totally resonate with this aspect, Aarti, where, you know, I own a car and uh, I, I don't necessarily enjoy driving. And I've always looked at, okay, when are self-driving cars going to become the norm? And I'm looking at you, you know, as you're working with startups in the AI community to focus on some of these cutting edge technologies. And it's ironic that you come from Detroit. So tell us more about 
how do you personally like self-driving vehicles and the concept <laughs> behind it? Well, I'm certainly intrigued by the concept. And I actually, my start with autonomous vehicles actually started as an undergrad where I got to work on autonomous or self-navigated tractor and um, with John Deere. And um, so I, I definitely love the concept of autonomous vehicles. I will say from where I sit, I still have some ongoing concerns about the maturity of the AI technology. That being said, there's some amazing people working on it. So I'm definitely looking forward to the day. I wonder if my kids, for example, will actually need to get driver's licenses or not. And I think they probably will, but it's at least a possibility that they might not. And that's pretty exciting from um, a technology standpoint. You know, I hear that. So what do you think? Would it be a mix of like a hybrid technology where it's entirely autonomous, but you as the user has some oversight to make sure that you have you have the pause <laughs> button or the stop button when push comes to the show? Well, that's actually a very interesting question because it seems like obviously that would be the way that things would go. And I think for right now, we are sort of in a hybrid mode where maybe you have a little bit of lane keeping in autonomous vehicles. Those are in many cars that are on the road right now. But one thing that gets challenging is the more actors that you add to a vehicle like that, the more likely it is that you're gonna end up in some very unpredictable corner case. So it's really hard for me to predict from a complexity of the AI modeling, it actually makes it harder to have a vehicle override, but this is where that sort of intersection of technology and government and community values come in. From a legal standpoint, it makes it a bit easier actually, because you can ultimately say the human had something to do with whatever happens next. And I'm just gonna make a little plug. This is one of the reasons why I spend so much of my time trying to convince people with technology and STEM backgrounds to get engaged with your local government and your local communities. They're the ones who are starting to make these decisions right now of what to allow on the roads. And the more input and advice they have, the, the more likely they are to make at least technology and informationally informed decisions. Two things that always intrigue me. One is, you know, we fly on planes all the time and our planes are on autopilot mode most of the times so with the pilots having that override option. When something as sophisticated that's flying in the air, you know, is able to embrace this technology, you know, is there a, a legitimate concern apart from the infrastructure issues that's really stopping us from embracing the full potential of AI in self-driving? Um, yeah, well, I definitely think there are real issues with respect to understanding how do we regulate these technologies? How do they fit into our existing legal framework? Do we need new legal frameworks? And then there's a separate issue, which I think is one of equity and accessibility. So the, the second one maybe is a bit more straightforward. Who can access, access these new technologies and what happens if they can't? But I think that there's a different equity issue, which maybe is more obvious with AI in areas like facial recognition. And there's a lot of discussion, I think, these days of facial recognition technologies being biased. But I think it plays out in other ways, too, since we have an international audience, traffic patterns in everywhere I've been in India are completely different than everywhere I've been um, in the US. And so if these technologies are being developed in one country, do they really, will they really serve the needs and the ways of being in other countries? And I think these are things that we need to think about, especially when internationally, there's also sort of a lack of equity in technology capability across um, different countries. And some of the most populous countries, for example, might have less access to some of these technologies that here in the West are, you know, we talk about as reshaping the world, but really they're not at, at the moment being accessed um, as equitably. Now, that's when you talk about India and China, there's differences there because you have very strong technology and AI ecosystems as well, but it'll be interesting to see how this all plays out. And I'm super fascinated to see, yeah. you know, there comes a day where I oversee what my car is doing when it's running itself and, you know, feeds its own gas. So maybe I'll go for a complete electric vehicle, right? Where I don't have to do literally anything. Now let's talk about your nonprofit yeah. uh, for which you're the chair. 
it's called the engineers and scientists acting globally locally i should say yeah. so it's yeah. uh, esal so engineers and scientists acting locally so that the global world can actually benefit yeah. from you know these different engagements that you can do with the group i understand it's a national organization dedicated to increasing city county and state level engagement by professionals with backgrounds in stem and you know what arthi i think it's a perfect segue uh, given the work that you've been doing to engage all these different communities you know having this strong organization to continue that engagement tell us a little bit more about your thought process behind this and what the future is or you know your envision as part of it yeah so so the way that esal got formed is it, it's sort of very tightly tied to my journey from washington back to city government in that i had spent a lot of years in washington as you pointed out kind of working i worked in foreign policy in, on the hill and then i worked in the white house on national research and development policy and then i i moved back to california as a data scientist but they talk about potomac fever people go to washington and get bitten by the dc government bug i got bitten by some kind of bug but i guess it was more of just a government and engagement bug and so i started by um applying for an appointment to my city government and then realizing even just among the alumni of the program that originally took me to washington dc am i the only person who's done this and I, so i reached out to my alumni network and i discovered more people were interested in local engagement than had actually done it so that eventually led to the founding of engineers and scientists acting locally and you know our mission is just to get as many people with backgrounds in stem to be engaging with their government their local governments their local communities the need is amazing i think we've learned that in the last year with covid and how much local governments have been trying to understand brand new science but so many other things we've talked about autonomous vehicles um, in the US at least our elections are also overseen by local governments and if we really want to think about the technologies and even just the mathematics and science underlying it, um elections people who know something about that just speak up and um we can make a difference you know that's uh, very notable to hear yeah. where uh, you know you get something from the community that you live in and i've lived in dc for a good part of my life since i moved to the us and i understand you know when you look at you know how stakeholders come together and what is the way in which you can actually act as a facilitator so kudos to you on this venture thank you all right so I have some you know the personal side of arthi that i want to explore are you ready for that sure so arthi you have a handful of degrees so dr garg holds a phd in physics from harvard university and a masters in aeronautical and uh, astronautical engineering from stanford university as well so tell us a little bit more about you know as an asian as a woman of color how does it feel having these professional accolades and intellectual uh, equity that you've achieved through your education so i think that for me um I think it it's a little bit I, I work in heavily male dominated fields I should say so I'll start with the the woman piece and say that so that can be sort of uncomfortable I think at times and also I mentioned I think it's important that you have all different kinds of voices and perspectives contributing to technology development so sometimes I feel like I have to be the voice of the people who are not represented in the room but in a sense i think i've been very lucky and maybe there are very strong aspects of my indian asian indian community that have been helpful for negotiating that or feeling comfortable in that space i mean i'm just going to shout out to a few of my close family members some of whom hopefully are listening um one thing is my mom she's always inspired me because she says things like well somebody can do it why can't i if a person is doing it and that's something that always sticks with me is that she never lets anything frighten her she says well if someone else can do it so can i and um once when i was feeling a little bit do i belong here in the tech space my sister said to me you know what if you're there you belong and you deserve to be there and act like you deserve to be there and then beyond that i just have the most amazing um set of grandmothers, you know, chachis, masis, aunties. I've been so lucky to have such a diverse set of um people and strong women in my life who have shown me different ways of being leaders and different ways of being strong people and 
I consider myself really lucky. And um, I think that part of Indian culture has really um, helped me feel stronger in these environments and more capable. I love you have your own tribe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, you know, a big thank you to all your tribe who's watching this from India as well. I hope they get to see how successful you are as you look back at your journey and take a moment to reflect and celebrate those achievements because as part of the Indian community, right, we hardly take time to feel good about a lot of things that we achieve in our life. So tell us this, Aarti. I know you have your successful tribe and you've matured as a leader through experiences from different parts of your professional experience. But how do you handle low moments in your life? What is your go-to tool that you have at the back of your yeah. mind? Yeah, I think I kind of take two two approaches to it, one of which we already talked about. But my first approach always is to just give myself a little break and step away from the situation. That could be going on a walk. Um, I'm, I'm lucky you mentioned I live in California, so I can do that year round these days, unlike Michigan where I grew up. And um, Or, you know, it can be anything. It can be watch a mindless TV show, just something to break myself from whatever is causing me, um, causing me to feel low. And then the other one, I apply it to my life too. If there's something, usually something's causing it. Something's causing you to feel low. It's either, for me, it's often something that just feels overwhelming. So I try to just figure out all those sub pieces of it and then pick what is the most appealing. It doesn't have to be the most strategic. If it's, I have a hundred things to do and one of them is to send a two line email, I'll do that because it feels like I've accomplished something and it feels just a little bit better. You know, I love the fact where you know, you explore the nature sometimes and that's all that you need to get a break and then put your mind back into where it needs to be. Yeah. That's awesome. So we have a fun rapid fire on for you. Are you ready for it? Okay, definitely, yes. All right, so you tell us the first thing that comes to your mind when I say the following and in one word, role model. Oh, too many. I've already shared all of the different role models I've had in my life. It's hard, impossible for me to pick one. What does happiness mean to you? Being content wherever and whenever I am. How do you define success, Aarti? Just being able to do something I love that makes an impact. What is one fun thing about you that's exclusive to our Career Leadership Podcast listeners? Uh, well, I, I feel like as a girl from Detroit, sharing my dislike of driving is <laughs> I've already relieved, um, revealed quite a bit. <laughs> Hey, I'm with you on that. So yeah. you have some <laughs> yes. company there. Last question. What is your native language and one word to describe yourself in your native language? Well, I grew up in a home that spoke mixed Hindi and English. And I thought about this and I think that actually my parents, maybe they named me well by calling me Arthi. I mean, we know it as a form of prayer, but it's derived from the Sanskrit meaning removing of darkness. And as an astrophysicist, light is very central to me. And when I think about what I really love to do, it's I want to help people see, see new possibilities, see new ideas, and find a way to leave their old biases behind. You know, I love how you're connecting the dots. It's <laughs> removing darkness, obstacles, and that's what you're doing, you know, being the AI lead at HPE, at the same time serving on your city commission as well to eliminate all the uh, the naysayers and to make sure you know there's progress and foresight thinking going forward. Yeah. That's awesome. So we have a couple of quick comments from our live listeners. Let's check on them. We have Satya who says, very interesting and impressive interview. Thank you, Satya. Thank you, Satya. And we have Harsh who's been engaging with us with some of his thoughts on AI uh, and autonomous vehicles. And let me just share one thought from him who says, um, you know, by working at the city county uh, level, uh, you can reach your community and advocate, you know, to the government as well. So that's a wonderful, uh, you know, path. Totally agree. Th yeah, that helps totally you agree, raise your voice. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Hars, for sharing those wonderful thoughts as well. So that brings us to the end of the episode. Aarti, any parting thoughts to our listeners before we wrap up? Yeah, so I've got two. First, I just want to remind everyone, I think it's helpful to think in terms of what you can do and not what you can't do, because you'd be amazed at what you can achieve with the things you can do. And 
probably what you can do is a lot more than you give yourself credit for. So that's my first parting thought. And I think along those lines, I want to encourage everyone to join Priyanka on her leadership podcast in the future to sign up and subscribe because it's a great source of inspiration and it's a great reminder of what all of us can achieve bringing together our you know current accomplishments and what we've learned through our community um, and our families back home speaking of family we have some family here as well we have disha <laughs> srivastava who says proud of you didi ah uh, <laughs> thank you disha i'm proud of you too <laughs> thank you didi, for joining us as well we have amita gamage who says inspirational interview thank you amita thank you so drum roll as we pick our lucky live listener who gets this free one-on-one -on -one session with you and we have wait one more comment as well we have one from Ritu Garg, who's joining us from India, who says congratulations. Uh, Thank you, that's my passion. chachi. <laughs> so that's well, I'm so glad your chachi. tribe is on it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thank you, Ritu. Thank you, Disha, for joining us as well. And thanks so much, Harsh, Satya, Amita, uh, who are watching this live. Uh, this podcast is going to be available uh, for replay any number of times on all our social channels, YouTube, LinkedIn, and any podcast platform. So you can always get to hear the nuggets of wisdom from Aarti. So the lucky live listener who's going to get this free one-on-one -on -one session with Aarti is Harsh Purohit. Uh, thank you, Harsh, for your engaging comments. And we hope it will be a good chat for you to connect with uh, Aarti and take the conversation forward as well. So uh, Harsh, and I'm going to connect you offline with Aarti. So congratulations, uh, Harsh. So excited to have you and win this one-on-one uh, -on -one session. And we have a couple of other closing comments. Obviously, we have your tribe, says Go, <laughs> sis. And then we have Surendra Garg, who says, so proud of you, mom. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> With a lot of people who are very proud of you. Uh -huh. So thank you so much. Um, and there's Harsh, who says, thanks for winning that free one-on-one -on -one session. Thank you, Harsh. Such a pleasure having you as well. So that brings us to the end of the episode. I hope you enjoyed this as much as we did. We learned a lot about Dr. Arti Garg, her work at HPE, her work as uh, you know, a public citizen who's focused on bringing the government, the academia, and the corporate sector together for forward thinking uh, projects. And her love for ice creams and balloons as well, right? You know, some <laughs> fun things that we always resonate with. So, on this episode 107, you know, the three takeaways that I'm going to leave you with is number one, don't take no for an answer. And number two, break complex problems into simple problems. And number three, something that I really admire is, you know, when you're speaking with someone, speak in a tone that has that emotional connection. And I think that's what a lot of us kind of miss. So hopefully we'll get to keep that at the back of our mind as part of our toolkit to have more engaging, healthy conversations with people around us. Talk about issues from their perspectives. And I think that will have a better buy-in from them. Thank you so much, Aarti, for those wonderful nuggets of wisdom. Congratulations, Harsh, on winning the mentoring session as well. Anything else that you want to say, Aarti, before we wave goodbye to all of us here? No, just thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And start small, but go out, talk to your neighbors, talk to your local government. You'd be really surprised what a difference you can make. That's awesome. And we'll leave you that with that parting thought. And to our live listeners, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your support. So if you're watching this on YouTube, give us a like and a subscribe. For our LinkedIn users, feel free to drop in a comment and a like. And as we have, as we host this on our podcast platforms, you know, give us a, a, a follow, a review, and a rating to help us understand how this podcast is helping you become a better version of yourself. And our episodes are live every Sunday, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time. So we'll rock you to bed if it's part of your sleeping routine every week with a wonderful guest from the Asian diaspora. Until next Sunday, this is your host, Priyanka Komla, signing off from Career Leadership Podcast, a podcast to spotlight purpose-driven Asian leaders making an impact.